I have a dream that one day, no matter how long it may take us, as long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. This is a time of challenge to our interests and our values. And it's a time to test our wisdom and our skills. This will not be a campaign of half measures. And we will accept no outcome but victory. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. Well, good morning. As you've already heard, we're in the middle of a series called Oh Say Can't You See, and we're uh, talking about politics. You may not know this. Uh, the election this year, 2016, is on Tuesday, November 8th. It's always on Tuesday, which is only 45 days away from today. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do for the next 45 days. I'm going to ask you to do three things for 45 days. Number one, I'm going to ask you to pray. Pray for the election, pray for the, the country, uh, pray for, as we talked about last week, uh, an awakening, a revival. I'm going to ask you to pray. Here's the second thing I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get informed, okay? Learn about the process. Learn about the candidates. Uh, don't just vote because you've always voted, but learn and get in the, as informed as you possibly can. Let me give you a little secret on this. Facebook is not the best place to get informed, okay? Find a credible place and get informed there. And then here's the third thing I'm going to ask you to do. Make sure you're registered to vote and go vote. Well, I live in Texas, so my vote doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Go vote. Pray, get informed, and go vote. Pray. Do you believe in prayer? Does your life reflect your belief? It's kind of like the, the small town that had a small church in it. This was some years ago. And uh, this town had historically been dry, meaning that you couldn't sell alcoholic beverages in the city. But then a local businessman decided that he was going to open a tavern. And see, he opened the tavern, and uh, a group of Christians that attended the church became very concerned about this. And so they called a prayer meeting. And they came together and they prayed against the tavern and against the selling of alcoholic beverages. And a few days after this prayer meeting, lightning struck the tavern and burned it to the ground. So the tavern owner sued the church, <laughs> claiming that their prayers had burnt down his tavern. And the church got an attorney and argued in court that they had no responsibility for it whatsoever. So in the pretrial hearings, the judge stated, I don't know how this case is going to come out, but here's what I know. I know I've got a tavern owner who believes in the power of prayer and a church that doesn't. <laughs> Do you believe in prayer? And does the way you live reflect that belief? So we've been in Jonah during this series, the book of Jonah, and we're going to go there again today. If you've got a Bible with you, that's great. If not, you can pull out your phone. I think we're also going to put it up here on the screen for you this morning. But we're going to be in Jonah chapter 2 this morning. Now let me catch you up. Jonah was a prophet uh, who God showed up to and said, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh and tell them that they are wicked and evil, and if they don't change their ways, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Well, as you can imagine, Jonah wasn't really pumped about delivering that message, so he ran the opposite direction. He ran down the other direction towards a city called Joppa, which was a port city. He boarded a ship and got on the ship, headed as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. While he was on the ship, God sent this big storm. Uh, the sailors who were on the ship realized that he was the reason for the storm, and they threw him overboard. And so he's been thrown overboard the ship, and this is where we catch the story this morning. I'm going to begin uh, with the beginning verse and then go to the end verse and then we'll come back to the middle. But here's the beginning verse this morning. And it's in Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 and it says, and the Lord appointed a great fish 
to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now that word appointed means that God had arranged. God had this all worked out. God was in control then. God is still in control today. And God had this arranged that this big fish, it never says well, but we assume it was probably a well. Here's one of the reasons why. Not too long ago, there was a well that beached itself. It came up on the, on the shore. And uh, researchers, when looking at the well, found that there was inside the belly of a well a 40-foot squid that weighed 400 pounds, completely intact. If it could handle a 40-foot squid that weighed 400 pounds, I'm sure it could handle a 6-foot, 200-pound Hebrew prophet. So there's probably a well. This well swallows Jonah. Now flip over to Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now... Many of you in this room this morning are familiar with the story of Jonah. Some of you may be hearing it for the very first time. If you are, great. But for those of you who are familiar with the story of Jonah, you know this. So when I read that this big fish swallowed Jonah, and then this big fish spit Jonah out on the ground, you're not shocked by that at all, are you? Because you know the story. You know what happened. You've heard it a hundred times. But what if it read something like this? God arranged for the Texas Tech defense to rise up. <laughs> and they won the Big 12 championship. You, wait, how would you, what, what, what's your response to that? You're like, yeah, that would be great, but whatever. All right, wrap your head around this. A fish swallowed a man. And after three days, spit him up on the dry land, okay? It would be like me saying, and God had it arranged that the citizens of the United States of America would come together in one heart and one mind and elect a president unanimously. That's a little bit more doubtful, isn't it? Or how about this? And God knew at the right time and in the right place, the church would come to life. And the United States would see a spiritual awakening like it's never seen before. Right? I want you to get this perspective of the story we're looking at. That Jonah had been thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, and three days later spit out onto dry land. And now I want us to look at what happened in the meantime, in the middle between Jonah 1, verse 17, and Jonah 2, verse 10. Jonah 2, verse 1, reads this way. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Sounds like a pretty good time to pray, doesn't it? Between being swallowed and spit out, Jonah prayed. When all else fails, pray. I want you to notice something in the story of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1, when God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh, he never prayed. At least it doesn't tell us he prayed. He just decided he wasn't going to do it. He never searched out whether he really should do it or not. When Jonah was on the ship, he was down in the bottom of the ship. The storm comes up. Even the sailors are praying to their own gods. And they come to Jonah and say, would you pray to your God? And scripture never tells us that Jonah prayed to God. It wasn't until he found himself in a dark, stinky, slimy pit that he prayed. Aren't you and I just like Jonah? Isn't that usually when we offer up some of our best prayers to God? When all else fails, when we've come to the end of our rope, when everything else we've tried hasn't worked, When we find ourselves in the darkest, stinkiest, slimiest place, God hears our prayers. Look, that's what happened with Jonah. In the belly of the well, keep reading with me. I called out to the Lord out of my distress. That's when you and I pray, right? When we're distressed. Out of my distress and he answered me. 
Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. That word Sheol to a Hebrew would have meant death. Jonah was saying that he was either close to death or he thought he had died. Or maybe he was saying he wished he was dead. Have you ever been there? That's when some of the greatest prayers ever spoken get spoken. That's exactly where Jonah was at. He says, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. He's sinking to the bottom of the ocean. The flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. He's overwhelmed. All the waves, all the billows come over him. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Have you ever been there where you just feel like you're drowning? Your marriage is drowning. You're drowning in your finances or lack thereof. You feel like you're going nowhere in life. You're just drowning. It's exactly where Jonah found himself. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I'm in verse 6. At the roots of the mountains, he's describing the bottom of the ocean floor, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, when I was in the worst place imaginable, when I thought it was all over, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation brings to the Lord. In the stinkiest, darkest, slimiest place, Jonah returned to God. In the darkest of times, Jonah returned to God. Out of desperation, Jonah returned. Returned to God. And God spit him back up on the dry land. Last week we talked about spiritual awakenings and spiritual revivals. And I want to share with you this morning that in every spiritual awakening, in the Bible and in history, other than in the Bible, in every spiritual awakening and in every spiritual revival, there's a series of circumstances that occur. The first of those circumstances is desperation. In every revival, in every spiritual awakening, it always begins with a circumstance of desperation. That a person is desperate, that a group is desperate, that a nation is desperate. And out of that desperation, that person or that group or that nation returns to God. They begin to pray. They begin to turn back from their ways to God's ways. And in turning back and in praying and seeking after God, a supernatural move of God happens. In every awakening, in every revival, you can see that that takes place. Out of a moment or out of a place of desperation, we return to God and God moves in a supernatural way. I can show it to you all through the Bible. Just read through Kings, First and Second Kings this week you will find that God's people would follow God for a while. They would follow after him. They would chase after him. They would be obedient to him. And then they would begin to follow their own ways and do things the way they wanted to do them and, and, and do it however it pleased them. And then every time, here's what would happen. They would become desperate for what used to be, for how they knew it could be. And out of that moment of desperation, They would return to God. They would follow after him again. They would begin to obey him again. And God would do a supernatural move. You can read it in 2 Kings. All these different kings that God raised up that would lead the nation, lead God's people into these moments of awakening and revival. You can read about it in Ezra. There was this gentleman named Zerubbabel. Just say that because it's cool. Zerubbabel. Right? That just feels good off your lips. Zerubbabel came back and rebuilt the temple. What does Jonah say? 
I looked again upon your holy temple. He's referencing returning to God, praying to God. He says it down here. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. He returned to God. Zerubbabel returned to rebuild the temple. And not only rebuilt the temple physically, but returned the people to turning towards God. And God moved in a very supernatural way. Nehemiah followed him and built the wall around Jerusalem. The same thing happened. Out of desperation, people returned to God, and God moved in a supernatural way. I can take you outside the pages of the Bible just to world history and American history. I won't bore you with the world history today, but let me just share with you some American history because we're in this series about America. Most historians tell us that there have been four great awakenings in American history. Four great revivals in American history. The first of those, the first great awakening, happened in the early 1700s. This was before the American Revolution. This is as people were moving from the old world to the new world. Why were they moving from the old world to the new world? Because they wanted to find religious freedom. They were tired of their oppression. They were tired of things the way they were. Ha- there was a desperate situation. And they were wanting to move from a desperate situation. And moving from a desperate situation, they turned to God. They began to pray. They began to seek out new ways of doing things, moving to an entirely new world. And God moved in a very supernatural way, led by evangelists like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitefield, and John Wesley, who, by the way, was the founder of the Methodist movement. It's told that probably during the years of 17. 17- 40 to 1742, 50,000 people came to Christ on American soil. Now, let me remind you that during that time, the population of America was only 300,000. A great awakening that was birthed out of a moment of desperation where people turned to God and God moved in a very supernatural way. The second Great Awakening. The second revival happened in the early 1800s. This is prior to the Civil War. Can you imagine the desperation that existed in a polarized nation before the Civil War? If you cannot imagine a polarized nation, what hole have you been living in? Can you imagine that desperation? And and evangelists like Charles Finney began to return people to God. They began to have these great prayer meetings. They began to show up at churches and services would go on and on and on and on. In fact, the service would not end until people responded. Let me say that again. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. The service would not end until people responded. And what I mean is by responding is by responding in a supernatural way. The Holy Spirit would get a hold of them and they would begin to shake. They would begin to speak in languages they had never spoken in before. These incredible things happened. This was in the second great awakening in the early 1800s. And then there was a third great awakening. And this was in the late 1800s. This was after the Civil War. And this was in a time of great... Uh, unrest, unsettlement, again, after the history of the Civil War. There was a lot of turmoil in America. In fact, the stock market crashed in the late 1800s. Let me share a story with you. This guy, his name was Jeremiah Lamphier. He was not a preacher. He was not a clergy person. He was a businessman who lived in New York. And he began to fill this burden for his community and for his nation. And so he went to Fulton uh, Church, Fulton Street Church there in New York, and at noon he began a prayer meeting every day at noon. And at first it was just him and a couple of other people until the stock market crashed. And then all of a sudden, what happened? It was a desperate situation. And so people began flooding into the noontime prayer service. Before long, Fulton Street Church couldn't hold everybody that was coming to the noontime prayer service. And so people from other churches there in New York began to come and see what they were doing, and then they began to do it in their own churches there in New York. And then people from churches in Pennsylvania and Rhode Island and Connecticut and all of these other places began to come and see what they were doing, and they took it back to their states and their churches. And before long, thousands and thousands and thousands of people were praying at noon every day for revival for an awakening in the United States of America. And historians tell us that tens of thousands of people were coming to know Christ every week. 
because one businessman had a burden and started a prayer meeting that initially was poorly attended. There was a fourth great awakening in American history. Many of you were part of this great awakening, or at least witnesses to this great awakening. You're called hippies. I mean that in a very good way. It was in the 60s and the 70s. Can you think back, or for those of you who weren't here yet, Think about your history and what was happening in the 60s and 70s. It was a very difficult culture to live in. It was a time of continual threat of war, not only threat of war, but threat of atomic war. It was a decade or decades of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The church had lost the ability to connect with a new generation. Listen to me, I want you to hear me on this. This is why we are meeting here in this space for the weeks that we are meeting here in this space. And this is why what's happening across the street where we typically meet is happening across the street. Because today, the church has lost the ability to connect with the new generation. And so whatever we do and what we are doing is to help us connect with the new generation just like it did in the fourth great awakening. You may remember this if you were alive then, but the cover of Time magazine, April 8, 1966, the cover of Time magazine had in big red letters, it's all that was on the cover of Time magazine, it said, Is God dead? Question mark. In comes the Jesus movement. Churches began to do things differently. They began to break out of their ruts. They began to say, hey, what we're doing is not working. There's a group that we're not reaching, and we need to reach them. And God can do anything. This started in California. And it began to sweep across the nation, the Jesus movement. And then in June 21st, 1971, just five years later, a new Time magazine comes out. And the headline this time is, The Jesus Revolution. Thousands of people coming to know Christ. In fact, I would guess that some of you in here came to know Christ during the Jesus Revolution. And now your kids and your grandkids can know Christ because of the Jesus Revolution. Many historians tell us that today, in this time, we are in the middle of another awakening. That we are in the middle of a great revival right now. We can't necessarily see it, but as all history happens, sometimes we can't see it until we look back on it. Is that right? And historians would tell us that right now, we are in the middle of a great revival. And here's the reason why. Because there's a very desperate situation. And in the desperate situation, we know from history that God can move in a very supernatural way. And so if you believe in prayer, now is a good time to start. Because the only element missing that would make this a great awakening is prayer. Will the church rise up and be people of prayer? As has existed in every other great awakening in biblical world and American history. Yes, times are desperate. Yes, we believe that God can do something supernatural. Will we pray? Do you believe in prayer? And does the way you live reflect that belief? So here's what we're going to challenge you to do as we continue to move through this series. 45 days left until election day. We're going to challenge you every day at noon to take time to pray. Wherever you're at, Whatever you're doing, however it works for you, that you would pause and take a few minutes to pray. You may be thinking, well, what do I pray and and how do I pray and what does that look like? And we're going to help you with that this morning. There's a great declaration in the Bible. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, the people have just built the temple. And they are celebrating, and this is a good time. It's not a desperate time at all. But God makes this declaration and gives it to the people because he knows there will be a point in time where they will again turn away from him. 
And here's what he says. At that moment, in that time, when you turn away from me again, be reminded that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, and seek my face, will turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive them. And I will heal their land. I would suggest we pray that. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Here's what we pray. You see, we're so tempted to say, well, it's the Republicans' fault. Well, it's the Democrats' fault. Well, it's Hollywood's fault. God didn't say if Republicans would pray. He didn't say if Democrats would pray. He didn't say if actors and actresses would pray. He said if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves. I'm, I'm asking you for the next 45 days, I'm asking myself, can we humble ourselves to realize that we're in a desperate situation and we need a supernatural move of God and it starts right here. I'm going to ask that you just take a moment Maybe you just close your eyes. Maybe you just look up. Maybe you do whatever you do. Just take a moment to humble yourself. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves.